In his 1984 survey of multiple burials in prehistoric Europe, Klaus Westrika noted that burials containing more than one individual are more commonly found in richly outfitted chamber graves. The sample of multiple burials has expanded significantly in the years since Westrika's study, and it may be time to revisit this mortuary category in the light of new evidence. While most multiple burials contain two adults, often a female and a male, other combinations are also known. These configurations have traditionally been interpreted as representing familiar relationships or a prehistoric form of widow's sacrifice. However, new evidence indicates that this category of burial cannot be reduced to a simple or single causal interpretation. Significantly, at least in southwest Germany, the combination of adult male, adult female, and sub-adult is the least common type of multiple burial, suggesting that familiar relationships may in fact not be the primary the determining factor in this particular cultural context. Burials containing more than one sub-adult are also rare. We present the argument that the connection between elite status and multiple burial category in southwest Germany should be critically deconstructed. For this, we will make use of ethnographic analogy, as well as several more recent burials excavated in the vicinity of the earlier Iron Age Hollywood, Hilford, to suggest that new ways of interpreting this complex mortuary context. The German term Mehrfachbestattung is defined as the simultaneous deposition of at least two individuals within the same mortuary feature, for example, a coffin, burial pit, urn, or chamber. Some Iron Age burials containing more than one individual are also what is known as e ritual, meaning that post cremation and incremation rites are represented in the mortuary context. The complex factors involved in determining which death was the one that preceded and or precipitated that of the other individuals in a multiple burial is one of the main challenges of interpreting this burial category. Not being able to determine the simultaneity of disposal when more than one individual is present in a burial is a major problem. There is, in fact, some evidence to suggest that a form of ritually motivated post depositional disturbance of central burials was practiced in some areas, which complicates the assumption that all the individuals in a multiple burial were necessarily <coughs> deposited at the same time. The interpretation of multiple burials as a form of sati, or widow sacrifice, in which the primary burial is a male and the secondary a female, can clearly be rejected as a general rule for Iron Age Southwest Germany at least. Although this form of ritual practice is historically associated mainly with the Indian subcontinent, when it is defined as a custom whereby a woman commits self immolation <coughs> after the death of her husband, the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit term sahagama Sahagamana, going after, is used more frequently in the ancient texts, and, and as a more neutral term, also more useful for our purposes. It is also worth noting that at least in the Indian subcontinent, the practice of Sahagamana, which is first mentioned in the 4th century BC by Alexander's generals as a primary elite phenomenon, does not appear to have become common among Hindu and Sikh ruling families until the 5th and 9th centuries AD. Archaeologically and historically, the practice of Sahagamana is attested in most areas influenced by Hinduism, such as Vietnam, Sumatra, Bali, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. East Asian examples include some areas of China and Korea. It is also documented in a range of old world contexts west of Asia, including the Anglo-Novo cultural complex of the Asiatic steppe, in which approximately 2% of the burials and the tumuli were buried male female interments, and which overlaps in its later manifestations with the earlier age in Western Europe. Herodotus mentions a version, version of Sahagamana in his description of the customs of the Thracians involving the choosing of a favorite wife for sacrifice. A comparable example appears to in the well known 10th century D account of Im Fatlan, who describes the killing and eventual burning of a slave woman. <coughs> during the funeral of a Volga chieftain. 
Perhaps significantly, the spread of this practice in the Indian subcontinent appears to have been due largely to emulation of elites. Andrea Breuning has recently noted that in some parts of the West Hallstatt area, and I'm sorry for using Hallstatt again and again, but if we do it as a terminus technicus and in content, I fully agree with John. Multiple variants occur mainly in the large burial mounds surrounding the Holy Book and the Honaspa, as well as the Magdalenenberg in the Black Forest. However, the fact that at least two cemeteries in the Dauertal, Imfing and Ambleabach, also contain multiple variants that do not fall into the Mega Mount Paramount elite category indicates that this apparent pattern may be the result of a bias favoring research during systematic investiga investigation of large amounts rather than an actual qualitative distinction between high status barriers and those belonging to the secondary status diet. Even in large tumuli, not only the central chamber grave is necessarily the only one containing more than one individual. This is illustrated by the Magdalenenberg, a mega mound on the eastern edge of the Black Forest that contained numerous multiple variants, including several very regional variants. Most of these graves involve individuals with relatively modest assemblages. Particularly interesting was the placement of a young adult female just above and directly aligned with the coffin-like chamber of a significantly older, more elaborately outfitted female. Neither of these graves qualifies as a paramount elite and their simultaneity appears to be confirmed by the archaeological evidence. Even within the Holy Book Info region, recent excavations have indicated that multiple barriers may not, in fact, be confined to the uppermost echelons of society. These barriers are described briefly below, followed by an attempt to reassess this mortuary category in light of new evidence. One of the four 50 meter diameter mounds close to the Holy Book, the central chamber of East River Dash Autumnus 1, presumably contains three inhumations. One female of circa 30 years of age, a male of over 50 years, and a father female of unspecified age. This burial, excavated in the 19th century in 1877, illustrates another problem with this multiple burial category. Can proximity of grave goods to the body be relied on as an indicator of association? A group of three iron, iron spearheads and a bronze leaf shaped spearhead decorated with latent like compass designs were found to the left of this female body, while the male individual apparently was associated with a dagger, a ceramic vessel, and a bronze object. The third body, if present, appears to have been buried with numerous amber beads and other ornaments, as well as textiles decorated with at least 100 gold and silver staggers. The neighboring tumulus too from this Vitarha was also unsystematically explored in 1877. According to the report, the, the two inhumations uncovered in the central chamber were very poorly preserved, and none of the described breakthroughs have survived. Based on the limited information available, the chamber, which had been looted in antiquity, contained fragments of iron weapons, as well as the remains of several small bronze objects. Two individuals were supposedly originally buried in the looted central chamber of the Homicidae, the largest of the mounds in the Speckle group, about three kilometers west of the Holy Book. Although the mound had been unsystematically investigated in the 19th century, most of what we know about it is the result of excavations conducted by Gustav Lee in the 1930s. <coughs> the central chamber was looted initially in prehistory based on the robust trench tunneling into the side of the mound and entering the chamber at the level of the ancient surface. The looters had apparently removed personal ornament at a time not long after the position of the bodies, based on the discovery of more than 700 green glass beads and fragments of string in the chamber as well as outside it. The presence of such a large number of glass beads strongly suggests that at least one of the individuals <coughs> was female, based on mortuary patterns from this region. The extremely acidic soil conditions resulted in different preservation of organic material such that bone was virtually gone, while animal and human hair were partly preserved. The grave had originally contained a presumably four-wheeled wagon. 
At that moment, Morgan made the correct decision for the threat, and a tassel was found in a fragmentary state in the southeastern corner. Another dead metal bronze blackheads was found in front of the chamber near the Luther's trench. The terminal portion of a break of human hair that you can see here at the bottom was found in the same location near a miniature ceramic vessel. Kutz Mina uh, names a mortuary ritual by Iranian speaking peoples involving the placement of a cut plate of hair by a widow, a practice found until recently among Kurds and in Ossetia. This appears to be an example of a substitution hair for the good person, but whether the grave belonged to one of the individuals interred in the chamber or one of the mourners cannot be determined. To the southwest of the central grave of the Homicili, the undisturbed grave 6 was uncovered. This secondary burial contained two inhumations, one likely male, one likely female. Greek interprets this burial context as probably as a proper example of, of Sahagamana, what he terms Lippen for him, but notes that the male individual could also have been the servant or an armed returner of the high status female individual. Traditionally, in the pictures, the woman was portrayed. Uh, staying uh, below the wagon. This has only been recently revisited, also based uh, mostly on considerations of uh, gender ideology provided by the Dinaano. A different type of explanation is required in the case of the two inhumations, post other females, recently discovered in the central chamber of Betelbury Tumulus 4. The first problem is how to interpret the apparent evidence of disturbed grave goods and body parts which resulted in the displacement of the cranial elements belonging to the female individual presumed to be the primary inhumation. This individual was accompanied by large quantities of gold and amber ornament. The second problem is represented by the fact that the less richly ornamented female appears to have been buried on a platform of earth above the chamber floor. It is unclear at this stage whether this accumulated naturally or indicates that this burial was placed there at a later date than the other one. And you can see both burials here, the one, what it's considered the central burial of a female here with very rich grave goods and some other elements dispersed, including the skull, and then the second female burial here in the corner of the chamber, which lies a bit higher. The excavators of Pettenberg have assumed that an economic relationship existed between the two women based on the disparity between the personal ornament and samples, and have designated one as a princess and the other as her maid. But it might be worth attempting to subject both bodies to ancient DNA analysis to test this assumption. Another explanation should be considered as well. In several respects, this multiple burial context seems analogous to the double female burial in Magdalenenberg, grave 78, previously discussed. The central chamber of Speco Tumul 70, excavated by the Tina Arnold and Masri Murray, illustrates how recent advances in technologies, such as proteomic analysis of ceramic vessels content, can change our assumptions about mortuary practices. The 5x5 central enclosure contained a cremation, likely named and a likely female inhumation. As you can see, there are many problems about the determining actually the sex of the individuals based on the acidic soil conditions in this poor area. <coughs> Here we have what appears to be an example of a big ritual burial with the fragments of iron weapons and weapon remains probably belonging to the disturbed central cremation, while the female inhumation was placed at a slight angle just inside the enclosure ditch. However, the position of the female grace seemed odd from the start. Why place the body in such a, a half a sad way, so close to the edge of one of the largest central chambers of any of the Hollywood mounds? The results of a recent proto-omic proto analysis of six ceramic shirts from vessels belonging to the central burial show a five children evidence of human blood and tissue that retain the distinctive protein signature of an hemorrhagic fever virus that would have resulted in a painful death accompanied by profuse bleeding. This provides us with a cause of death. At the same time, the, ha the hasty disposal of the female body could be explained by the highly infectious nature of, of disease in this class. Anyone handling the body, for example, in preparation for a funeral, and in particular if that preparation involved examination would have contracted the disease. 
It is certainly plausible to suggest that the woman buried in the central chamber may have had to be disposed of quickly, as much to protect the living as to allow her to accompany the central individual in death. The question here is whether this particular woman had any familiar relationship to the deceased, or whether she was simply placed in the central chamber because she died in the same way as the primary individual. The avoidance of this mouth as a burial place after the construction of the tumulus over the chamber may also be explained by the specular and presumably a very gruesome end of the individuals in the central enclosure. It is unusual for a mound of this size to contain so few graves. The neighboring mount, the neighboring mount Speckle Tumulus 18, was atypical in that rather than a chamber, the central burial consisted of the remains of a funerary pyre that appears to have been allowed to burn down in situ. The charcoal carpet that remained included extremely small, high, highly calcined mold fragments from a male individual. Fragments that may be the remains of a young child were recovered from the same context, while additional cremated bone was recovered from the highly disturbed area outside the fire zone that has been identified as belonging to a major female individual. It is possible that a relationship existed between the likely female and likely male individuals buried in grades 4 and 5, based on the close proximity, but technically this does not qualify as a multiple burial because there is no evidence of simultaneous disposal or the presence of a burial chamber large enough to hold both bodies. To summarize, the examples provided in this paper illustrate the fact that the defining characteristic archaeologists use to differentiate multiple burials from other forms of disposal, namely the presence of more than one body in a single mortuary context, may fact be the least important feature of this category. The fact that B. Richard burials are quite common in some regions of southwest Germany in the early Iron Age are not found at all in others, and the uneven distribution of combinations through time and space indicates that the range of possible relationships between individuals found in the same burial context is even larger than originally supposed. Even at the macro at the macro regional level, in this case represented by the Honeybook burial record, there is simply too much variability for any one causal relationship to be the defining one. Familiar, economic, martial, political, or accidental. Significantly, of the five large mounds in close proximity to the Honeybook, at least three is with Dalhau tumulus, three and four, and also the Lendl tumulus do not seem to have had more than one individual in the central chambers. This indicates that multiple graves were not a requirement of central burials, but were presumably the result of other variables that go beyond simple social status. In short, we have too little information at present about the range of possible links between individuals in multiple burials to hazard more than a guess about why particular persons may have been buried together at what appears to have been the same time. A systematic analysis of the full range of burial mound types in an already intensively studied macro region like the Hollywood will be required to formulate more nuanced explanations for this complex mortuary category. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>